Welcome to Crest in partnership with Elusive, producer Dodd here. Our guest this week is none other than Hugo Tagholm, who most of you will know from his amazing work with Surfers Against Sewage. We cover a wide range of topics from surfing and the environment to meeting Prince Charles. We did record this episode about a month before release, and since then, both Hugo and the aforementioned Prince have both received significant promotions. Hugo is now the leader of Oceana UK, and we wish him all the success in the world in his new position and his ongoing mission to protect the UK's oceans. Enjoy! Welcome to Crest in partnership with Elusive. Hugo, how are you doing? Hello. Good evening, Tom. You, uh, you managed well. There's no, no waves where you are today, is it? Are you, are you in Cornwall? Are you near St. Agnes? Because yeah. that's where SAS is. Yeah, I, mean, well, I live in Truro. Um, I, I had a swim at Perranporth, which is one of my favourite beaches to surf at, but it was very, very small today. Just some residual northerly yeah. wavelets um, from the wind yesterday. But um, apparently we've got swell on the way. There's a big low pressure tracking up and it's looking like it could be quite fun um, into next week. So, um, yeah. So, um, so I've been told that at the time of recording is the uh, the water still really warm down there. Rob and I were in Newquay at the Boardmasters recently and surfed in shorts down there very comfortably. Yeah, it's um, it's warm, you know. Um, you know, I swim a lot in shorts, um, surf occasionally in shorts. Um, and yeah, it's the warmest I've, I think the warmest I've, I've known it actually here, but I think that's the same across Europe. I was in France and Spain a, a couple of weeks ago and it was 23 degrees the water. Wow. Um, I mean, like some of the warmest water I've surfed in sort of ever in a way, certainly in the Northern Hemisphere. So, wow. so yeah. Now you, you, you bring uh, glad tidings there, Hugo, talk of swell on the way. I hadn't actually looked at any forecast, so that's good news. Um, and it's well, my son, my son's like a frother. He loves he loves getting in the sea, and he texted me in the middle of the day with a, a pressure chart and a, a wind chart going like it's on basically. So. Resident swell uh, forecast. How, so. how old is he? He's fourteen. Oh, a proper proper keen grom age. Then he's watching all the movies and all of that either in front of the movies or trying to get to the beach um it's been a bit of a disappointing summer but we'll get we'll get there the autumn is is beckoning as of to, as of tomorrow a bit. so yeah it's interesting to talk to you on a on a personal level like that but it's also great to talk to you because not only are we interviewing you the uh, the individual but it feels like we're talking to the incredible body that is SAS surfers against sewage uh, an organisation yeah. that holds a massive place in, in British surfing folklore, certainly, and, and indeed in world surf culture too, from the uh, the legendary inflatable uh, poos um, and gas yeah. masks creating a scene in Downing Street uh, to today when you, uh, uh, as an SAS, are pretty much a globally recognised lobbying force. Is, is yeah. that a fair thing to call SAS now, Hugo? Well, look, I, look, I hope so. Look, I, I'm, I'm sort of flattered. You know, I've worked really hard to develop it into, you know, a globally recognised um, campaigning and advocacy charity, um, you know, across lots of different issues. And, um, um, and you know, really, really proud of what we've been able to do. Um, we've got a great team um, running great campaigns across plastics, climate, water quality, of course, has been top of the agenda, which I'm sure we'll speak about um, a little bit um, again um you know to today um but yeah it's been it's been a labor of love i've seen you know seen it through various iterations actually my first you know experience of ss was just after it was originally founded back in 1990 um i, I took part in a surf competition called surf to save in paul zeth and met a couple of the sort of founders there um and um and sort of had a relationship with it in one way or other as a member and supporter since then and then and then I actually sort of took over in 2008 when it was the, the organization was sort of on its last legs. It was it had run out of ground. It didn't really know where it was going. And I came in with some really good charity experience to redevelop it and almost refound it into what we've we've um, we've got today. And so really sort of proud of what we're doing and the connections it's brought us around, you know, around the world and the impact we've been, been able to have, you know, winning legislation, mm. lobbying hard, still deploying the inflatable turd here and there a, gas masks come out regularly <laughs> um you know and um you know it's um it's good to see so many people you know you know coming to us we work yeah. with you know hundreds of thousands of volunteers and supporters every year and instead of a like an interesting space in, in surf culture you know i really i really truly as a surfer myself and a 
you know, I'm a bad surfer, but I love it. And um, I've been doing it a long time. And I, um, you know, surf all sorts of different craft, you know, um, and, you know, I just think that's at the very epicenter of this organization. It's always been about that, that connection with the sea. And it's broader sometimes now, you know, we represent certain swimmers, you know, people who use the water in different ways. But at, at its essence, mm. we're about that thrill of riding waves, what it exposes you to and what, what it, it sort of empowers you to think about yeah. doing for the the environment you love and how it kind of yeah it, it does connect you doesn't it it's, 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 there's very few surfers who don't have you know and i find it baffling when i when i know surfers who don't think like that yeah and, and are not that way minded um has it been yeah. quite important then to sort of um know understand and honor sort of sas's legacy coming into the role because it, it feels to me as though sas certainly has been one of those organizations where you really feel like the organization's um character um, mm -hmm. changes with its with its head head honcho you know so so yeah. in the Chris Hines years it had that kind of zany anarchic identity mm -hmm. to it you know then Andy Cummins was 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 in charge for a while and then you know under yourself it seems to me to be sort of bridging that kind of uh, you know past that sort of it belongs firmly in that kind of anti-establishment surf culture type background but then mm -hmm. it's also sort of has that kind of pragmatism which is is probably the only way um, to save the planet, if uh, if such a phrase uh, is, isn't isn't too far over the top, but but has that been quite important yeah. to sort of look? I think you know every sort of organisation sort of probably has a sort of a big sort of fingerprint from its sort of um, leader, um, and, and I think you're sort of right. I think you know we we you know I've been sort of involved for a long time as I, as I've said and been leading it for 14 years now, so I sort yeah. of it were the longest serving CEO or sort of director really um you know Chris did a great job and inspired me in the 90s it was actually then it was led by a woman called Vicky Garner in the early 2000s and then went across to Rich Hardy right. um, um who led it in the sort of early to mid 2000s and Andy worked for, for Rich and then for me and and I took over in 2008 in the in the crash and you know, I've I've sort of ha had a long established connection with the, the the charity. It wasn't a charity before I took over. It was sort of had it's a, a sort of vague yeah. en entity, yeah. um, and I wanted to keep the best of it. You know, what I figure is we've sort of kept the best of it in terms of the anarchy, the sort of rebellion, but we've also then added to it. I'm a firm believer that you can sort of campaign in all sorts of disguises. Yeah. You can be in a wetsuit and a gas mask and have an inflatable turd, but sometimes you need to masquerade in a yeah. suit and tie <laughs> and pretend that you, and you've got like, like a, like a, you know, a, a, an extensive education <laughs> to, to get you into that room. I, I've got to ask you, know, you I think, go on, sorry. And I sort of think it like sometimes gets some confused, particularly in this day and age, because we see this quite polarized world of like all of these people outside like places campaigning, waving banners. And then, and then they sort of think that the people inside things might not be campaigners, but mm. people create change in lots yeah. of different ways. And so I sort of think it takes, you need to know, who you're talking to, how you're talking to them, and how you sort of flip between characters. Because, you know, as it were, just shouting and just protesting doesn't always get you to the point that you want. You need to negotiate, you need to be tactful, mm. and you need to be able to deliver your campaigns in various ways. So it's a sort of a combination of factors. But I think the most important thing, really, from the whole era, you know, from 1990, May the 10th, 1990 is when it started, you know, right through to today, the, the really key and most important anchor is that it is connected to the ocean and surfing. Yeah. Like if that's lost, if there was a leader who didn't, who didn't surf and didn't understand the sea, then it's like, what, like, what would it be? Yeah. You, you've just mentioned there, Hugo, how long you've been involved with surface against sewage and, and the, the kind of how it's changed over the years. You will of course, remember the toxic trophy down at Langland yeah. in, uh, yeah. in Swansea yeah. over the years. We have to ask on behalf of the, of the surfers of Wales, like, you know, is it coming back one day, the toxic trophy? Well, look, I think, I think we should start like, uh, you know, a change.org petition to bring it back. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Let's, let, let, let's do it. This, let's get that sound bite is going on the Langland the, Surf Riders Instagram. Langland surf. Perhaps the third time I've mentioned it on Crest, but I cried in my first ever heat at the, uh, the Toxic Trophy in Langland, because I had an ice cream head <laughs> yeah. paddling out as like an eight-year-old. <laughs> well, 
Well, it's funny all of those sort of legacy things because, you know, back in the 1990s, you know, when SAS first started, you know, surfing was still much more of a fringe thing than it, than it is today. Mm. You know, there were no yeah. wave pools. It wasn't in the Olympics. We yeah. didn't have, you know, there weren't elite athletes. I think the sort of training regime of the pros back then was a couple of spliffs and yeah. a few cans, yeah. like, you know, in, in between heats. Yeah. You know, and I think, you know, I think today it's a very different space and, 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 and that's sort of, you know, interesting for sort of how we do things because there's lots of love for some of the things. And I sort of weirdly, you know, if we look at other sports, there's love for that whole area. And if you look back at sort of the, the more rootsy things in racing, in sort of Formula One or in football yeah, and the carried one the years, yeah. and the bargy bargy and it was gritty yeah. and it was raw. Yeah. And a lot of rawness has been pushed out of sport now. And I think I think that, the, you know, in, in terms of us as an organisation, some of the things that were historically really loved, you know, the SAS ball, some of the comps, oh, not just SAS you know, the toxic, ball. You know, the toxic yeah. trophy. Some of these people still talk to me about today. It's I don't like, think fancy they were dresses amazing. even exist anymore, anyway. <laughs> they were amazing in the 1990s yeah. when there was less licensing and regulation and stuff yeah. and there was, wasn't a festival every other weekend or every yeah. weekend. But today, you know... You know, it's imp- it's impossible for an organisation like us to actually make those things stick. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you've got to you've got to focus on the campaign, and we run things sort of in in various ways. So, you know, it's sort of good. You know, I'm, I'm most proud of being able to give you know 30 campaigners and 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 team members great jobs year round to to fight the good fight, um, and and create you know really engaging ways of taking the public on the on the campaign path with us. Well- Talking about campaigning, um, Hugo, it's been a big summer for Surface Against Sewage with uh, the fallout, excuse the pun, uh, from the political argument over Amendment 45 and the Storm Overflows Discharge Reduction Plan. We had beaches yeah. closed here in South Wales for a few days in August, and Tom uh, even got asked to go on BBC Wales today. There's a joke in there somewhere. I think I saw being, you. I think I saw you desperate. commentating. Yeah. Good job. There's uh, so there's yeah, like I said, there's a joke in there about being desperate somewhere, but I'll leave that. <laughs> Can you update us on on where we're at with that particular battle, please? Look, yeah, well look, I mean let's let's go sort of sort of right sort of back because you know, we've been campaigning a long time for transparency on data. So one of the things that we wanted to hold water companies to account with was was the releases that they're putting into not just our beaches, but into our our rivers. And we've been really successful on that. And you'll probably be you know familiar with our Safer Season River Service, mm. um, which we give, you know, we're the only organisation that gives national real time alerts when there's a sewage pollution incident or when there's diffuse pollution. And so we lobbied really hard for that and got it. And it's a lot of that information now that's that's exposing the water companies for what what they were sweeping under the carpet, you know, for all of the last 30 years since privatisation in 89, which is whilst they've stopped, you know, the continuous discharge of sewage offshore, which was a chronic issue back in the 19, you know, 80s and into the 90s and something that Chris and the early crew at SAS campaigned against. What they've done is carefully and strategically hidden a lot of their sewage pipes in other places and then bypassed detection um, and used ways to uh, to sort of avoid those being picked up by water quality testing generally so you know then we come to where we are today um, and we, you know we campaigned hard through the environment bill to get amendments that would have put more pressure on the water companies including the wellington amendment which would have you know, been much more um, the Duke of Wellington Amendment. Is that which the one they're been calling much... Amendment 45? Uh, yeah, I, be- I believe yeah. It, it was Amendment 45. Producer Dodd is giving and, us and, a thumbs up. And they, they, they basically voted, voted it down. And we got some amendments, some sort of interesting things, but not enough. And and where we are, where we were on Friday, and let's, let's see Friday. So basically what happened over the last two weeks is there was an incredible amount of media interest and pressure on sewage discharges. We went from really hot weather where water companies were, you know, you know, really complaining that they couldn't manage too little water to suddenly yeah. too much water with the rain and they complained that there was too much water. And so it seems they're only really geared to manage very light rain in overcast conditions, about 16 or 17 degrees, yeah. you know, the classic British summer day. And, and anything either side of that is considered an extreme. And, and so suddenly there was all this sewage. And I came, but I've just come back from, I've been speaking at an event in the, in the States, 
just came back. First thing I did, I did a tweet about all of the discharges. And then that evening, I got a call at 11 o'clock, Radio 4 Today program, senior tweet, can we have a quote for the morning? I was like, sure, let's do that. And then all hell broke loose and every news station was picking it up. And for the last two weeks, we've been, we've been contending with that. So the, 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 the water industry and then the government have been under pressure on this, this euphemistically entitled storm overflow reduction plan. Yeah. Um, and that, that was released in classic government style on Friday of bank holiday weekend at three o'clock yeah. when they calculate that a lot of campaigners have gone home. Some people are in the pub already. No one's going to pay much attention. But sadly, people were paying attention. Mm. And the really critical, crucial point of it, if we cut away everything, is what that plan did was effectively make it legal for water companies to dump sewage into rivers and coastlines under any weather conditions until 2050. And that was something that undoes the regulation 1991, the Water Industry Act, that said it was only acceptable in in extreme weather conditions. And so... So the government has effectively voted to allow water companies to dump sewage whenever they want. Yeah. Um, so I, I hope that made sense. It made <laughs> it made perfect sense. Um, so we've had uh, on this show in the past um, the uh, the, on, the the honourable or is he right honourable? He's honourable. He's just honourable. We did ask him if he was wrong honourable as well. Um, Dave T C Davis, the MP, um, and and Dave has voted with the government on each of these main votes. Um, yeah. So prior to getting yourself on, we gave Dave a quick ring. Um, and in fact, yeah. was, we had Elliot Dudley put in a question to Dave on behalf of Surface Against Sewage when, when Dave was on our show. Yeah. Um, Dave would sort of, be, if he was sat here now, he'd be saying um, that, um, that, he, that he worries that Surface Against Sewage and some of these environmental campaigners have used language, which is a little bit too kind of black and white to describe the real picture, you know, saying that the MPs have, have voted to pump sewage into the sea um, and and that the government have always been taking steps to reduce sewage overflow and that if Amendment 45 had passed, sewage would still be being pumped into the sea um, and, and that, you know, that Amendment 45 had to, had to be voted down to prevent sewage being flooded back I- I- into people's homes. Um, he 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 says the government accept the criticism that perhaps you know that, that, that they or that or that it's a fair criticism to say you might not have done enough maybe you should have acted sooner, but he wonders whether some of the sort of language used um, you know there was a carve article saying that you know MPs had voted to pump shit into the sea um, you know so that's what that's what he would be saying if he was here um, right now sure. what, what what would your response to that be? We've got your attention. <laughs> would be the first part of the response um and um that they effectively have um i mean w- w- we i'd like them to sort of explain why i'm doing the regulation of the 1991 water industry act that that stipulated that water companies could only pump um sewage out in extreme weather circumstances and then and then changing that to um to only being enforceable after 2050 isn't actually a license for them to do whatever they want to do with sewage with impunity so that's you know that's one thing and you know i think i mean he opens up really a pandora's box of of what's happened over the past decade or so um including under um liz truss as environment secretary um removing huge tranches of funding from the environment agency Mm. um for environmental protection including uh millions of pounds that would have held water um companies to account you know, there, there is there is a, a real sort of smoking gun on this. Mm. And we're very political as an organisation. We want to see the right thing happen for our rivers and coastlines. But, you know, this government hasn't made all of the right decisions, um, including on Friday. And we want to, you know, that needs to be rectified. We've got a water industry, a privatised water industry in England that... Um, that effectively are just regional monopolies that have harvested billions of pounds over about 70 billion since privatization Mm. you know weirdly the money that came out in the press release that the government saying that they're now committed to to getting you know invested over the next 25 years 56 billion is sort of exactly what the water industry has taken out already so i figure we've already paid for it and we shouldn't be paying again for it so um you know this is you know this is um 
this is a story of our time and we're talking on a day when you know energy bills um, are predicted to, to potentially go up to about eight thousand pounds next year for an average household i think that's probably from about 800 or a thousand you know less than a year ago um, like chronic inflation mm. you know from energy companies that are making massive profits every year we're seeing water industries taking out billions mm from this country and often offshoring that money and not paying any taxes mm. on it. Um, meanwhile, destroying our environment or contributing to the destruction of our environment. And this is about private you know, industries profiteering at the expense of people and the environments that you and I, that we, you know, rely on. It's not about the sort of, you know, surfing's like a selfish, you know, pursuit. It's like, you know, it's about your own sort of enjoyment generally. Yeah. But you can use it to to help inspire people and call out these these wrongs. Yeah. And that's what SAS has always done. It's like, you know, you're not you're not really an activist from your sport unless you go, right, actually I'm 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 annoyed that this beach or that beach I see pollution, plastic, yeah. sewage pollution. I see the impacts of industry, and I'm going to do something about it. So, you know, I sort of strongly sort of you know disagree. It's you you need binary language to engage people. We understand the complexities behind the solutions, and actually, the water industry is rich enough to do this, and they have the expertise to do it. And you know, the government themselves, if, if you know, if we really want to get into like a discussion around it, put some very unhelpful information into the public space, scaring people, 660 billion pounds, it's going to cost to do this. No one ever called for all roads to be dug up, all of our pipes to be replaced. What people called for was the water industry to invest in the right solutions in the right place to actually, you know, end sewage pollution, uh, our most, you know, pristine spots um, and sensitive yeah. habitats. And, independent study shows that would cost something between 15 and 60 billion pounds they can afford it i think also um i find statistics interesting there because 660 billion was it you said but yeah you divide that by the you know what is it the 60 million population of the uk 30 million or whatever it is that pays tax like you know you can make a figure sound enormous when six when 30 million people are paying it together can't you you know so, so yeah sometimes these yeah large figures you know that when you're not paying them yourself you know out of your own pocket they're not as big as they sound aren't they no yeah and look i think it's a you know a classic scare tactic i mean i just i think you know it's in the cost of living crisis we can't sort of do anything because it's going to impact you as an individual bill pair yeah. so what about the shareholders what about the billions that are being taken out i had a, an email this morning hugo for, yeah for a general email from the rivers trust and it broke down some of the what they see yeah. is the, the good points and the bad points of, of yeah. what's been passed recently. And it one of their, their main criticisms of it is that it doesn't uh, cost all the fixes needed. And they say that we've got to be vigilant as consumers that we don't end up incurring the cost of this rather yeah. than passing on to these, these enormous companies that you've already mentioned. Mm. Do you yeah. think that one of the large reasons or the large reasons for the, the government's inability to act is they place too much concern um, on protecting those profits and those big companies? Um, it would seem so. I mean, look, let's just look at a couple of examples. You know, when the banking industry was in trouble, the government had no problem parachuting in, what, 800 billion pounds very quickly to save bankers, right. you know, which largely paid for them to have some more holidays and, and the richest people to become richer. You know, we've currently got uh, what is probably one of the worst crises that we've ever seen in terms of affordability and inflation. Where, where's the government stepping in to help people? No places. You know, where is the capping of water industry bonuses and chief exec salaries? You know, instead they say, oh, you know, it might, you know, it's going to put up your bill. Let's, let's like cut down their, their salaries. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it? at the end of the day, you know, the, the water industry will be terrified of renationalization. Uh, you know, at the moment, whether or not it would be sensible to renationalize immediately, I personally think that this, these private companies should pay from their profits to mm. fix this you know, and from the wealth they've accumulated to fix it before we go into renationalization, because if not, we'll end up paying for it twice. Yeah. Um, and they'll walk away with their, you know, golden parachutes and we'll, you know, end up with, you know, you know, more costs. So, you know, I do think we live in a challenging time where, where the everyday person is ignored and penalized whilst we see 
the Amazons, the energy companies, the water companies walking away with billions with government going, look, we can't do anything about it. Mm. And not to labor the point too much, but look, we've just come through the pandemic, you know, we've come through the pandemic. Thankfully, you know, you know, hopefully it looks like it's under control now. Um, you know, lots of tragedy around there. But governments basically pass laws overnight to control you and I as individuals. They could just say, like, to, to, like yeah, this is a new law, you yeah. can't do this, you can't do that. Where's passing laws that quickly to protect nature or to mm -hmm. penalise businesses? They go, oh, no, it's going to have to consult on that for like a decade, and then it would take a decade to implement. And you go, fucking hell, it's an emergency. <laughs> we need it to happen like now. You can control us overnight. You know, one day we could go out and see our friends and family. The next day, illegal. Like, why can't it be suddenly illegal for businesses to do something? Why can't it suddenly be illegal to damage nature in a certain way? Let's like, let's try and have some more ambition about these things to hold the the big the big players to account. Now, a little while ago, Hugo, you you said something really interesting about the importance of using binary language to to make a point. And of course, organisations such as yourselves and people that are, are involved in using the water regularly and, and make a, a point of educating themselves about it will of course appreciate and to an extent understand the complexities that are involved with sorting out this emergency as you just phrased it yeah do you you feel that sometimes our and i'm going to put them in inverted commas here our natural allies uh, in the environmental movement can perhaps do more damage than good when they um, misrepresent as uh, david davis has termed it um mm -hmm. or putting their, their their point across in, like you've said, binary language rather than trying to go into more detail. Does that sometimes hinder hinder you as an organization? No, because look, I think I think, you know, David might be quite confused um, in the fact that, you know, organizations like Surface Against Sewage might use binary language to engage people, but there's a whole wealth of evidence and explanation and compromise at times behind the scenes and you know in the public space so we'll campaign on plastic free stuff and and and, and various you know plastics issues and there's a whole load of complex stuff behind it you know we issue many reports on on water quality and on plastics all based in the science and the stats um we argue our case in in parliament in downing street at the un in all sorts of in all sorts of fora you know um he might he might only have been exposed to ss in certain ways but if he digs deep he'll see the the depth of of the campaign so you know, I think it's um, it's about being able to communicate effectively. I'm not sure MPs can always do that themselves. Um, and so it, it comes down to organisations like SAS, but not only SAS, many brilliant organisations on a huge number of issues having to communicate and cut through. And I'll give you an example of that, which probably frustrates other organisations in our space. You know, when Seaspiracy came out, whenever, probably a year and a half, two years ago, you know, it was covering some of the issues that other organisations had issued brilliant films on and done great work on and explained it in very scientific ways. But they explained it in a very binary way, which was basically big industrial fishing is killing our seas. Yeah. Let's not, let's not go into loads and loads of detail and bore you off the face of the, the planet. Let's just tell you how it is. And it engaged millions and millions of people. And that took our, our sector, the NGO sector, by surprise. It took lots of people by surprise. But despite the detractors of it, it really cut through. Mm. And the, the, the fundamental the mm. fundamental aspect of it was completely true. And there'll be people who go, well, it was too. It's not quite like that. It's like, yeah, yeah. sure, you've got some of the things wrong and you're a bit clunky on the on this sort of indigenous rights and, you know, artisanal fishing. And it wasn't fishing or no fishing. But it was you know no industrial fishing because that is what's killing our seas does you you mentioned sea spiracy there do, do um documentaries programs the the use of this binary language sometimes offer let's again inverted commas uh, this anti-environment lobby does it give them an easy comeback to say well you you know you've got that wrong yeah they've they've, they've caught you saying something wrong so yeah. everything else you said must be wrong you know it's kind of Sure. I mean, that, 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 there's always a risk in that. I mean, that's even a risk in that if you say something, you know, it, with more detail behind it. People go, you, you, you got it wrong. Yeah. You've got the wrong facts there. You wrote the wrong thing there. And, you know, it's important when you do get things wrong to hold your hands up and go, look, I'm yeah. 
I'm I'm sorry, you know, yeah, I got that wrong, but but you know, the thrust of the argument is right, or actually let me re-explain that. So I think it's about, you know, being open and honest and transparent about things. And hopefully, you know, SAS is a is good at doing that. You know, we 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 you know will present things simply. We want to take people on a, a journey with us. Um, but um, but we'll hold up our hands if we get stuff wrong. Um, and and people should all people should always do that. I mean, mm. so yeah. Um, Absolutely. It's you, again. You made a, a fascinating point that the the facts are on the side of the environmental lobby, aren't they? And it's like, yeah, the facts cut through regardless of, of the hyperbole from both sides. The facts are what cut through, and I guess your organisation, Surface Against Sewage, wield that as your 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 biggest weapon in this the kind of the fight and the, the crusade yeah. that you're on. I mean, I think uh, I think you know the the the, the facts. You know, just generally, look, if we look at the state of nature, you know, the biodiversity crisis, the climate crisis, you know, more carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, you know, you know, you know, you know, thousands of species, you know, threatened with extinction, coral reefs that could be wiped out. You know, we are in an environmental crisis and, you know, we've seen what's happening at the moment in Pakistan. You know, the media are not picking up on it. You know, a third of the country underwater. Um in 10 billion pounds worth of damage over the last few days. Um, you know, goodness knows how many people will will lose their lives as a result of this. You know, the climate emergency is here, yet we've still got, you know, largely a media that doesn't acknowledge it, governments that don't look at the scale of action that's needed. Um, and we, we haven't flicked into emergency mode. You know, we, we, we flipped into emergency mode around the pandemic, you know, to come back to that. And, it, you know, it's sort of a, a dress rehearsal. You know, we all accepted things that we wouldn't have accepted overnight. I'm sure if somebody had come to you in January 2020 and gone, look, for the next two years, it's going to be a surprise. You're not going to be able to see your friends and family. You're not going to go out broadly. You're not going to be able to go to the pub. And there would actually be times you're not going to be allowed to go surfing. You would have probably laughed in their face mm. and go, I'm never going to sign up to that. Mm. And actually it happened and you did sign up to it and really willingly. Yeah. And I think that we're not at this stage yet, but in the climate emergency, particularly when we look at the, the food pressures and, and supply chains and everything, I think, we're probably going to, we're probably like passing some peak abundance stuff and people might start going, you can't have this anymore. And like, you know, when you used to be able to have like salmon all the time, yeah. salmon farms can't exist anymore. And mm. actually these products that you love, sorry about it, they're not going to happen. And maybe there's going to be a carbon budget that says, you know, you can't fly quite so many times in the year. Yeah, we're going to ask about you know, that so, a little bit down the line. So, you think, know, yeah. quite, quite a lot of things that, you know, we, we take as, uh, you know, as as our right, which actually we might we might actually succumb to much easier. I'm sure if people said that there's going to be no more Kinder eggs on Earth, people would go, probably we can live with that or whatever. You know, mm. I think it's um, I think we, we we've got to like start to to actually look at you know you know consumption and and governments will will have to intervene at some stage on just the the sheer perversity of how much is is being consumed, and that includes by all three of us and, and all of us. I mean, we live in societies where you can't help but consume at a pace that probably for most of the, 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 the country is at an unsustainable sort of level. Yeah, I got asked, uh, I was at the, the QS in Lacano a couple of years ago and I yeah. think a couple of SAS volunteers were there doing a little uh, questionnaire, you know, and they did a questionnaire with me. I think you were sat next to me, I think. No, maybe no. It was a Bourdain's. It was a Bourdain's. Okay. Oh, you were there because I remember it. Yeah. And uh, and after doing this little questionnaire with me, they were like, "Yeah, you're a, you're a five planet person." They said to me. And then they pointed out these various ways. Um, I, I drove a Volvo V40 at the time. It actually yeah. exploded on the way back to the ferry, and I replaced it with a Citroen C3, and that changed me. Basically, that and one or two other small changes, I managed to change into a three planet person. And then yeah. I, I remember having a discussion with someone where I was saying, like, you know, look, I've come from a five planet person to a three planet person. And like, as if that's a good thing, you know, but actually yeah. that is still, you know, is it, but actually getting yourself in the West, you know, down from a three planet person. And, and th I'm sure this was, I'm sure it was Surface Against Sewage. It was a Surface Against yeah, Sewage. Yeah, could, uh, could work me. Trick. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, interesting. You, you just. Well, yeah, it's sort of, it's a, a tough fix. I mean, look, I think. Uh, you, you might have seen sort of recently, um, 
James Lovelock died. Yeah, great. Um, uh, yeah, the, the author of the Gaia the, um, hypothesis. Uh, yeah. yeah, and he's pretty sort of pessimistic about the future, but he was also he had this sort of this 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 thread of optimism, which look, we haven't hit the point where we all have to go into, as it were, the sort of the the, the wartime solidarity yeah. and unite to face this. We were not we're not at that stage yet, but when it happens, there'll be there'll be a great sort of unification of people because because things will change just and and we did see that in the pandemic i mean it wasn't it wasn't perfect there was lots of you know there was lots of um imbalances and perversities you know rollouts of vaccines and and what people could or couldn't do and and the access ahead to things but there was a national sense of coming together and and i, and I think that that we're going to see sort of some other things like that, you know, in the coming years. And, you know, we, no one saw that coming. So who knows what's coming down the line in terms of how fast these things change. And, um, you know, I think we're, we will be sort of, you know, we'll be, well, we are in an interesting decade environmentally and we, we will see some, some big changes coming up, I'm sure, by 2030. So, Hugo, uh, going back a little while, you mentioned about the role of the media uh, in, in yeah. informing people about current... Um, situations, crises, what's going yeah. on. And as you alluded to, certain media organisations can pick and choose what they what they cover, given what, what else is going on in the world. You are someone that's, well, certainly in the past couple of weeks, as you mentioned at the beginning, have spent a lot of time uh, with various media appearances. Yeah. So I, I want to get your take as someone that's, that spends a lot of time engaging with these organisations. Uh, do you perhaps sometimes find... Uh, the hosts are necessarily confrontational. Um, do you ever see an obvious editorial bu- uh, bias? And a very interesting and topical question based on um, an interesting article with Emily Maitlis uh, I read earlier in the week. Is the, the media's commitment to balance sometimes harmful in situations like this? Yeah, so look, it's a really good question. And yeah, um, um, uh, yeah, I mean... You know, you will sort of you will sort of sense the politics of any channel that you're speaking to and the direction they might take an issue in of of who's to blame, um, you know, individual responsibility versus corporate responsibility, and you know the sliding scale from you know GB News to the Guardian and, and how people might approach things, you know. And there are things, there are shows that I refuse to go on to that I'm just like I can't. I, uh, I can't. I taught. Go on. An ex, an ex student of mine is now a reporter on uh, on GB News, and I'm uh, I'm repeatedly reminded of that by. Uh, <laughs> I say, hey, you know, and, yeah. you know, for all we know, um, they they so, yeah, up, they'll end up you know, you know in the we, Guardian one day. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, so. Yeah, you feel the sort of bias, um, and then you know to. Um, to the sort of second point, um, you know, you know, and Emily Lee Maitlis has been making lots of sort of headlines recently. I mean, she she's called everyone out on the sort of Brexit sort of issue of no one wanting to 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 talk about it in the in the media because, um, well, because probably they fear the sort of repercussions of of, of criticizing yeah, it. Um, um, but. Um, Sorry, what was the other point with Emily? Just uh, so um, the need for balance. Yes, sometimes, yeah, need... sometimes meaning that the idiot gets interviewed. Look, uh, look, I, I sort of yeah. Look, I do think it's it's challenging at the moment. And look, let's let's be honest. This is largely at the moment around the climate debate, yeah. in that they're still letting the climate skeptics in, and yeah. the the reality, you know, the the the, the unequivocal you know, science says that this is human induced carbon dioxide emissions and that the world is is changing dramatically and rapidly. We've seen droughts, floods and everything else, fires, you know, I mean we've had we've had wildfires in Cornwall. Cornwall's one of the wettest places on planet Earth, I think. Mm. <laughs> you know? Um so you know it, it's it, it's it's dramatic how, how you know really how much people are ignoring that and and making space for the the, the climate skeptics you know on on in the national debate is unhelpful to the the need for action for sure because people want to rely on that and you know it, it's the same on on a number of of issues and, and people will want to 
to come back at any environmental issue with the alternative facts, as they might call them. And we're in a... Sean Spicer, in a strange, I think, coined the phrase, didn't he? Yeah, well, we're in an age where people, sadly, you know, often there isn't a central sort of tenet of a truth that people all, like, debate around. Yeah. They go, no, we've got different truths. And that's particularly in America, you know, there's no agreed central truth that, to, around which everyone debates. It's like, no, no, we'll all hold different sort yeah. of polarised truths. I, um, and then we'll, we'll justify ourselves around that. And that's so dangerous. Yeah. It's like... Listen to a really interesting um, three-part podcast um, on BBC Sounds, actually, with Rory Stewart, with whom I don't always agree. Yeah. Um, the Long History of Argument, it was called. I highly recommend it. And uh, and in that, you know, he was talking about this idea that nowadays he thinks that the sense that between us we argue and it helps all of us get a little bit closer to consensus, that's gone now. And that basically, yeah. you know, people stand up in parliaments where they're supposed to argue with the person on the opposite bench and they shout past the person on the opposite bench mm. at... Their, yeah. their own followers um it's an interesting one the echo chamber i suppose is a challenge as well isn't it and getting out of that echo chamber and one of the things that you know we, we, you're talking about car you know i suppose there's carbon there's there's um sewage and then plastic is another big one you know we're talking about you know the oceans um and i know that's something that i think surfacing and sewage have been good at getting out of that echo chamber and getting beyond it and another campaign has been this naming and shaming of the producers of plastic yeah um and uh, yeah, it's an interesting when you were saying, oh, you know, maybe we can't have salmon anymore. Um, quite, would it be fair to say that down the line, maybe we can't have Coca-Cola anymore? <laughs> you know, and and and, and um, you can see yeah. why. You know that that you know, if anyone from Coca-Cola is listening right now, you know, like the sort of the the the, the you know, we're, we're you know, they'll deploy sort of everything they can, won't they, to 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 shout past that information and to, and, and, um, yeah, you know, I wonder, I wonder sort of, you know, what your thoughts on the successes and challenges of that particular campaign and, you know, where, where we're going are. Well, look, I mean, let's sort of, sort of, sort of break that down a bit. Um, you know, first just then pick up on the sort of salmon thing, because the salmon thing was like, when I was a boy, um, smoked salmon was like a christmas treat yeah. it was expensive yeah. and you'd have it like once a year yeah. and it would be like amazing right we're having smoked salmon it almost yeah. felt i mean it felt like sort of pop like posh to like have I, I do have to confess i have salmon once a week it's, yeah uh, it's and then you know now like, people can have it have to think people that. can have it every day because it's so cheap and that's like because salmon farms like are made and you, you know you know cages in sometimes in marine protected areas filled with diseased animals yeah that are artificially fed and looked after seven pounds of wild fish producing one pound of salmon. You know, it's like a, a super unsustainable sort of way of, of doing food. Um, I saw one that's another point. in, um, to, how, do, how do you pronounce it? Tsujiki fish market yeah. in Tokyo. And it was, it was horrifying yeah. actually. Um, I, I can't believe I do still eat it actually. You know, this, this enormous fish, and I, which I do believe had been caught, you know, wild. Something yeah. it must have been years old. You know, it had, had sort of had a whole yeah. life story. Yeah, and it was kind of you know filleted before my eyes, yeah. and it was a spectacular thing to see. But it was, you know, I uh, I, I felt very yeah. very emotionally disturbed at seeing it. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Go on. We're talking about the plastic thing. Yeah. You... And then like the plastic thing, you know the, you know. Um... I mean, I think we, we have to accept that, the, you know, the linear economy of what we've got at the moment with plastic packaging, you know, and um, we'll come on to the sort of benefits of it. You know, the benefits often are the, are the exact problems as well. But, but you know, this thing of, of consume as fast as we do and then, and then chuck all of that packaging away effectively, you know, even when people think they're doing the right thing, their recycling can often be dumped in a country without the resources or facilities to deal with it. You know, it's, it's, it's evidently broken. There's plastic everywhere. And I mean, you, you you travel and you would have seen it in every, you know, in, in every sort of beach you go to in every environment, some worse than others, you know, particularly in, you know, developing countries. Mm. So so it's like a, a really chronic issue. And, and, and these industries are pumping out more and more single-use plastics every day. And they're not... They're not keeping pace, you know. The bins and the sort of infrastructure in our streets and uh, and everything hasn't kept pace with with just the sheer number of of, of products out there. And I'm I'm old enough to just remember when there sort of was far less plastic. And I mean, even taking bottles back with a deposit, you know, was a thing in in my time. Sort mm. of just pre all of the plastic bottles, and so 
you know, the, the, the industry needs to just remodel itself, more reuse and refill mechanisms. We need recycling that actually works. And, and the environmental sector does itself a dis, disservice sometimes on going like recycling isn't the answer. It's not the full answer, but there will be some recycling that has to be part of it. So we need systems that, that can, can do that properly because they're broken at the moment. You know, I'm I'm proud of what we've done. I mean, we we mobilise a lot of volunteers on beach cleans, and I love I love the communities they bring together. But they're not the solution themselves. Mm. But the evidence that they've helped, you know, collect has helped us deliver the the black bag charge. Has helped us deliver the ban on straws and stir. Has helped us lobby to get a deposit return scheme that's not in place yet, but is coming. Mm. It might not go as far as we want it to, but it's coming. And so there've been some big campaign wins actually on plastics. It's the first time SAS actually one legislation itself for the first time so we're we're um you know proud of you know of the, the movement we've built behind it plastic free communities the stuff we do in schools you know three and a half thousand schools a million school children all of that stuff mm. but the spit the, the tip of the spear is the camp the lobbying and the campaigning around it and trying to change policy and legislation to get get the systems change because without systems change we can all refill you know and reuse a little bit we can all choose to adapt our behavior a bit but without a big shift we're not going to get there and industry often wants to put out our door so they want to say the sewage problem is because we all flush a few too many wet wipes down the toilet they want to say the plastics issue is because we haven't refilled our coffee cup enough times and it's all our fault you know the climate issue is that we should probably cycle down to the shops and instead of take our car down to the shops mm. and it's always individual responsibility because that allows businesses to carry on with business as usual mm. and put all of the blame on us it's consumer choice it's like look actually if you create the right systems we'll choose i mean we never you know who knew that they wanted whatever yeah kentucky chicken crisps until the industry made them and if they take them away who's gonna care i was um i was i was reporting at a um played cymru conference oh this is going to be a long time ago now maybe 15 yeah. years 10 plus 15 years ago and um they had a guest speaker in um who had been involved in the planning of stansted airport and they were talking about transportation and you know the decarbonization of transport um and, yeah. and there was a lovely um maxim sort of put over in that conference i remember that that you've got to as, as government you've got to try to make the desired behavior the most convenient rather than sort of penalizing yeah. um you know the wrong behavior and i suppose if you think about it now you know taking our own bag to the shop you know that is now the most convenient behavior um for us you know yeah. um yeah so it's an interesting one um we're gonna move on from here now and, and ask you a couple of sort of slightly more um would i call it fun kind of questions because we yeah. got you in front of us right and you've met like some of the most amazing people on earth uh, well, yeah. no, have, yeah, I suppose no. Some of the most amazing people on earth are probably not famous at all, and you know, yeah, you know. Yeah, well, I've met some interesting. You've people met some interesting, sure. yeah, very, very sort of big, famous people, you know. And, and, yeah. and I just wanted to ask about a few of them, you know. I mean, Al Gore, for example, you know, um, who kind of producer Dodd sort of talks about Al Gore as like, yeah, you know, we nearly kind of saved the planet you know, like what, 15, 25, whatever it was years ago, you know, he could have, if he'd, recovered, yeah. you know, and, and, and like what a near miss, you know, what would the planet look like now if Al Gore had sort of, you know, had his way? And yeah. you know, what, what's he like as a person and what, you know, and, and yeah, your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, he was really, he was really nice. And I mean, he's one of my sort of personal sort of heroes, like in terms of, you know, of course his, you know, what he's campaigned for, for forever. Um, and, um, and the way he speaks and delivers the message and he does it in a very, very sort of binary fast paced way so i sort of like to try and model some of my talks on how i'll i'll talk so it was good to see him i saw up in edinburgh last last autumn at a ted a ted countdown event and uh, got to chat to him for a little bit which was a you know a real a real um honor um you know lots of my heroes i've been able to, or people i i really sort of admire um, I've been able to meet and sort of work around Sylvia Earle, um, uh, David Attenborough. Yeah, what's what's uh, Sir Dave like? I was like super starstruck, you know, <laughs> when I met David. And, you know, and he um, and you probably don't you know, get starstruck present. that easily. You probably have met lots of not, not that easily these days. But um, but yeah, it was a, like a real sort of honour to um, to present him with a plastic free award, and he was very um, very. Um, 
you know, gracious and interested and, you know, sort of knew of Surfers Against Sewage. And Did he? Yeah, it was, oh, wow. It was a sort of a, a really great moment. And then, of course, you know, some of the stuff that I wouldn't have expected through SS, you know, um, you know, our first patron, you know, Prince Charles. And, you know, there's, there's you know, various opinions on on the monarchy and, and the royal family. Yeah. But from an authenticity point of view, you know, Prince Charles has been talking about environmental issues for 40 years and has been, you know, really championing lots of good sort of things. And I first sort of hosted him in an event in 2015 in in Newquay, where we brought together quite a lot of different NGOs, and I, you know, had to sort of show him around and introduce him to a lot of people, like a hundred plus sort of people he had to meet, and then, and um, and then we sort of struck up with sort of a weird, you know, relationship. We see each other in various places, um, and and have talks at round table discussions on plastics and other things, and we hosted him a couple of times in Cornwall, and um, he became sort of patron. So it's been quite, you know, interesting, unexpected, you know things like royal weddings and, and other things. I never really thought SS would bring me. I was always on the sort of campaign and beach side and, and, and these things happen. So it's been, it's been great, you know, and I think good campaigning involves engaging lots of people across the spectrum. I love working with our grassroots and being at the beach. And I like, I like influencing with people who can make big decisions. I mean, you've got to be able to do both things. Mm. Um, you mentioned, in some of the you know discussions that have, have been had um, with the environment, you know this idea of sort of um, criminal liability, um, mm -hmm. and part of what you have to do, we talked about being pragmatic. You know, you got to meet, you got to meet the Prince Charles's of this world, or you know the Dave Attenboroughs might be a good example. You know, you also have to be able to sit down and you know have a have a chat, be pragmatic with you know the Dave T C Davis, or you know who who incidentally is a is a very pleasant person to go for a surf with. Maybe you may, might not be a pleasant. Sure. You know, we might not agree with the things he votes, but he's a very you know he's a, you know, and, and some of these people are very pleasant, very amiable. What happens when you meet like one of the you know, or have you met people who are the kind of like the big polluters? You know, like essentially the enemy. How how do you approach a conversation with some of these guys? Because I mean, sometimes I suppose you're not going to change their mind, are you? You know, they're basically on a panel to, to oppose you. And, and, you know, how do you handle meeting those kinds of people? Look, I mean, I think one of the challenges within any business is, you know, when you're waking up, at, you know, to go to work at one of these big polluters, you probably have drunk the Kool-Aid of the business and, That's a good way and, 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 and got, the, got the sort of... The, the you know all of the crib sheets which sort of makes you believe genuinely that you're not doing any harm and everything's fine and you've got things under control and so it's sort of a probably a human condition to go actually look it's you know we are doing our best and so so you know I sort of I recognize that when we go into a, to a room and 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 the, the important thing is is that we look at what the ultimate you know facts and uh, and what the, the the ultimate sort of as it were beneficiary is of of the action we want to take which is look if there is too much pollution and the facts attest to the damage it's causing year on year then it's a quite fairly unequivocal sort of position to take. They can't. They can't go. Well, no, that's not happening. And you know, sometimes it does happen. So with the water industry, for example, they might go, "Well, look, it's not just us. It's the agricultural industry too. So don't come at us." Yeah. You go, "No, no, no, no." Well, well yeah. people can come at them, and they can come at you. Yeah. You know, if you need to get your house in order, you deal with that, yeah. and we'll talk to the agricultural industry separately. But don't say we can't talk to you, and you don't need to get your house in order because over there there's another house that's not in order and so we, we I don't like that aspect of it but there is an element you know and you've got to recognize because we live can live in quite hostile times and there can be you know the, the and to your point of going surfing with with david you know like hi dave by the way lovely guy <laughs> recognizing people professionally but also as human beings yeah. and what's acceptable behavior and what is unacceptable behavior and how you would interact That's with really them. good point to you go, yeah. and the, the hostility and and particularly hostility that could border on you know insinuated violence yeah. in any form is unacceptable that's not campaigning that is that is you know it's not it's not uh, acceptable so it's about how you in engage and there are some direct action tactics that are good that target sort of buildings and industries in other ways without threatening life but there is a lot of hostility in social media 
in communications, in different echo chambers. And that can become really toxic and actually sometimes be counterproductive to, to campaigns because yeah. you've got to be able to engage correctly and politely. And but, but being polite doesn't mean you can't be forceful. You can be forceful and have good a good position without you know, degenerating into, you know, threats or violence or, yeah. or, or sort of un, unsavory behavior. So there's a, you know, a bit of, you know, you've got to consider how, how you, um, how you, you sort of do things. And um, yeah, I think that probably covers it. But you, you struck me then as being very sympathetic at the beginning of your, your response to Tom's question there, Hugo, whereby you said that they, they drunk the Kool-Aid and they yeah, like often that. genuinely believe what they've been told or what they're, they're reading in front of them that's been given them probably yeah. on behalf of the companies that they represent. But w what happens when it comes to somebody that does know better, that has perhaps, for argument's sake, has... Oh, um, Rob's been on Wikipedia here. Well, my research is done. <laughs> well, look, I think that's a good I, question. And I, I would de probably default to the last two weeks and then we'll be even more on the media... Yeah. Calling, calling them out and exposing the truth. And, you know, I think, I think um, you know, sadly, you know, we, you know we, we do have to agree to disagree many, many yeah. times with people. And I think that the thing is, is not to sort of allow, look, there's a thing in our space of, that I'm really conscious of. of and I've talked to a, quite a lot of people sort of around this, which is the, the, the for, for organisations like SS and, and probably all charities, the long arm of the establishment loves to come and put its put itself around you and go, look, you know, we're all friends. We're sort of working on this together. Do you want some money? Here's some money. Yeah. Um, you know, why don't we all sort of agree we've got to collaborate? And it's a really dangerous position to take when you get too mm -hmm. intertwined with people. And we've refused lots of money from people. We've refused money from Coca-Cola, from tobacco companies, from water companies. You'll have probably you know, we've refused money from this people. person that uh, Rob was with. Uh, researchers uh, page has got up. Uh, yeah, here. Who, what's, what's his name, Rob? Who's this? Yeah, so um, our researchers have, have um, <laughs> <laughs> they, they've basically they watched the BBC documentary. <laughs> they've watched the BBC documentary. But Producer Dodd has watched the yes, BBC documentary. It's a, it, it, yeah. it, it cites, I've got the Channel 4 one on my list as well. It cites the, the case of uh, Lee Raymond of ExxonMobil, who yeah. um, basically the crux of the documentary says that um, he spent his entire career. Um, this is, bear in mind, this is somebody that has um, a PhD in chemical engineering. And, yeah. and has a grasp of science and fact yeah. and spent his Literally, yeah. entire career denying or disbelieving the, the link between um, global climate change and uh, how human factors play into that. Um, and the, the documentary basically shows that um, he cast doubt on climate change in public for the duration of his career yeah, despite yeah. internal... Exxon research pointing to the role of human activity in this in this climate change. How? Yeah, look, I mean, look, let's, I mean, there's there's abundant sort of stories of these sort of corporate covers up. You know, the the Teflon sort of scandal, of course, cigarettes and the link to to cancer. You know, uh, there's there's been there's been a litany of these things. Um, you know, over time, and you know, sadly. You know, I dare say probably money often corrupts in these cases. Sadly, there will be people probably who haven't got such good morals, principles or values and, and, and are happy just to keep changing their position or taking the wrong position. So, yeah, I mean, you've got to you've got to take those people sort of down. Um, you know, we used sort of the example of some of the sort of the companies that we might work around here, the, the big plastics manufacturers, the water industries. And I think, you know, you've got to be very direct in your campaigning. You know, probably we wouldn't make it as personal with all of those, although I do think the water industry CEOs making so much money at a time of financial crisis and paying themselves big dividends or you know being paid big bonuses um and um and salary packages and putting out big dividends to their shareholders is is truly questionable on 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 water and they are being rightfully exposed on that um just because it is it is a, a fact and we do that in our water quality report and many many other things so mm. it's fascinating stuff now hugo um, we've got just two more questions for you this evening yeah now again not to go into too 
to binary of verse, I suppose, would be the way to put it here, and put you very much on the spot. What can our listeners uh, of Crestcast do? If um, you were to give our listeners perhaps three three pieces of uh, pieces of advice on A, how to decarbonize and B, how to protect the ocean, what would they be? Look, I think, I think, let me take the second one first. Um, you know, if you want to protect the ocean, I would really watch what you're eating from the ocean um, and limit your fish intake you know industrial fishing is 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 you know running a mark across our seas and you really should should think about what types of fish you're eating where they come from and um and that you can sort of really be assured of, of the provenance it's causing the least possible harm um because it can't cause no harm because the fish you're eating is sort of a bit of harm but there are more and less sustainable methods and types of fish what, what should you know, you we could be begin... avoiding as fish scallops I, I know is, is one of them isn't it scallops you know anything that's sort of dredged is is challenging um cod stocks are really threatened you know in, in the uk you know there's some you know various things i mean there's seafood guides out there but you know generally those sort of dredged species are are you know any dredging is is terrible for marine habitats um you know those those sort of older fish too you know and, and fish like tuna you know swordfish and things like that should generally be you know avoided um um for the moment so i think um you know i think thinking about what you eat thinking about what you consume um you know of course your plastic footprint your carbon footprint you know go for a green energy supply limit your flights and flights are difficult because i know people want to travel particularly around surfing you know do do what you can to, to to make the right choices um green energy renewable energy supplier um you know think about um you know what type of um um, you know travel choices you're making uh, on top of flying as well so you know various things i'd also say just join you know put your voice behind big campaign groups not just sas we work on some good issues but you know big organizations that represent you whether it's sea shepherd sea spiracy um you know human rights charities whatever it might be you know because of course you know protecting humans protecting nature is all part of the same ecosystem you know industrial fishing has loads of forced labor involved with it so these things sort of overlap massively so choose the issues you care about and really put your weight behind them you, you mentioned um, then hugo about the um the the need or not the need the want to travel with surfing and that does amongst other things such as the the, the choices of equipment that we use as surfers yeah, tend to lead us to be quite yeah. hypocritical in a way often people who surf and and, and use the water and, and nature for their enjoyment um, are, are the biggest voices in support of it but we we can be very hypocritical but that's not to that, that shouldn't put us off hmm engaging still i i yeah just very briefly i had a, a bit of a debate with one of my really good friends and it was around the it was a, a project in south australia to uh, drill oil in the in the great australian bite the blight, yeah and um bite yeah yeah i posted something on instagram about it and he challenged me and he said well you you can't possibly be against any oil exploration because you you fly to indonesia you fly to america or here or there to go surfing and my point of view, which is quite a hard way, to, hard one to deliver, was that you can be for something, but be hypocritical in a way. You can, it doesn't mean to say that you have to support uh, mass pollution in order to, um, just because you, you benefit from it in some way. Yeah. There's a balance to be struck, isn't there? Yeah, look, and we live in a, in a world of contradictions. Look, we've got a, a big, you know, probably a lot of the public understanding the climate change crisis you know we've got people joining marches on on you know streets whether it's you know fight uh, you know fridays for the future you know um you know stuff happening around that happened around cop 26 you know the the sort of climate protests we're seeing more and more sort of rebellion mm. but at the same time people are shocked and horrified when the pump prices go up and they want and they want cheap fuel. So there are paradoxes and contradictions within it all, in my opinion, which point towards the rapid need for systems change or a new way of being. Because, look, if the government came in and said, look, actually, we're doing a carbon budget, which means, you know, you've got, you've got one or two flights this year that are 
fine and then your s- second or third flight is very highly taxed very it's like three yeah. times the price to make you think then of course there's a challenge in terms of in terms of um fairness and equality because it's you know favors rich people but we'd, we'd adapt to a new way of being you know maybe people who didn't want to fly would would trade off their their initial things or whatever but i think there'll be new sort of new um new ways of doing things but there are contradictions you know let's look at the sort of elect you know the boom in electric vehicles and you know i actually haven't got one i've got an old citroen picasso uh, probably quite similar to yours tom terrible that's i'd actually i I managed to jet spray the fungus off the outside of it the other day (laughs) which i was pleased about that's a, um, a bit of biodiversity that was isn't it yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. It was a site of special scientific interest. Um, um, but, um, you know, electric cars, you know, the, 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 the mineral rush for those, yeah. for the battery, is causing havoc in the Democratic, Democratic Republic of Congo, apparently, right. um, and also potentially fueling the pressure on deep sea mining into habitats that are unexplored right, and the, where might be the, the minerals, yeah. funnels of, of, of life. So... You know, we, we, we've got to be careful about some of the solutions too, because actually the solution to the, the challenge of all of these petrol and diesel cars is not us all having electric vehicles. It's finding a new way of shared public transport, particularly in cities, yeah. that really is fast, sort of efficient, feels good, and is your default place. It's not everyone has has electric vehicles in, yeah. in the city in the way we have petrol cars. So the next time I go drive into a secret spot, I got to turn up with five mates, haven't I? Because then it's like we're we're we're, we're yeah. car sharing. <laughs> but you, but you, but yeah, as long as you blindfold them and then they get handcuffed in the car and then you <laughs> yeah, go yeah. surfing, fine. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, it's amazing, isn't it? You know, to, 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 yeah, think about and and you know we, we, we we're going to go there with this last question. Actually, producer Dodd has put the uh, the amber light up here. You know, um, he knows all this data on how long our podcasts have got to last, etc. Apparently, um, but let's ask about travel because you know we're part of part of your life has involved some amazing travel yeah. um memorable sessions amazing destinations favorite favorite surf spot you've been to abroad best trip i know that was several questions in one <laughs> look it's sort of i mean for, for first the travel one i'm sort of conflicted by because i do travel a bit for work yeah um and i try and go like uh, do i really need to be somewhere i'm having a good good contribution you know i was in california a, a couple of weeks ago hosting the big surf industry gala dinner at the waterman's ball in laguna beach you know and i figured yeah they asked me to host it i can do a good job and we raised quarter of a million pounds for for various ocean charities so i think i think it was good you know and i think it was valuable for me to go um Surfing wise, yeah, I've, I've have had the good fortune, sort of pre and post, sort of climate awareness recognition. Um, I got engaged to my wife in the Maldives nice. many, many years ago. Um, sort of tactically chose um, Don Valley Pasta Point as <laughs> as the the, the place to, to to go. And, uh, where so was we that? Got engaged. Now it was early two thousand. Did you, did you meet? Um, was Tony Hind? Still, still, still. He was, st- he was still there. He was still there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, I would love to have had him on this, but you know, obviously, sadly, he's yeah. no longer with us. And I got many, many good waves, and got engaged just in front of the the wave, which was, which was sort of cool. Um, so I, I love that. Um, not totally sure how I feel about privatized waves today, but yeah. um, but the good thing in the Maldives is the um. Maldivian surfers can surf on whatever way if they want. Yeah. So they can they're, they're allowed to. And I was there again relatively recently and I didn't want to um I did surf, but um I went uh, I'm involved with Save the Waves. So I went to see the president whilst I was there to talk about legal protections for surf spots, which which is 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 coming and there's quite a big recognition. The president's son is a is a pretty good surfer right. and so it's pretty helpful to connect with him and I'm doing some work with is, Save is the Waves. Save the Waves still Will Henry? No, it's run by a, guy, a great guy called Nick Strongsvetic, um, who's been running it for about ten years Will, now. But Will still, he? yeah, he's, he runs a runs a winery wow. now um, in uh, near Monterey, I think. Um, so yeah, Will's a, a larger than life. I've got, a lot, I've got a lot of time for Will. He's a great guy, um, as is Nick. Um, so yeah, we do quite a lot of work out there, you know, and with 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 that lot with with surf rider too you know i've had some fun sessions at trestles and stuff when i'm there i mean 
truthfully, where, my best session is really around here. I love surfing with my son um, and um, and finding ways here. Droskin, uh, you know, yeah. Perrinport is one of my favourite waves. I'm a goofy foot and on a on the right side swell at the right tide, it can be such a, yeah. an amazing wave. Um, so we're sort of all over, you know, down here from, you know, Senan up to, up to sort of Harlan, um, along the south coast, some sort of secret spots that are hidden, you know, in winter times. So I sort of love when there's a bigger, bigger swell where there's sort of sheltered spots. Um, um, you know, Australia I did a long time ago, um, which was good Byron Bay before um before it became super overrun, mm. which was fun. Although I was always scared of sharks out there. Yeah, right, right. Um, so. the, uh, the the passion with which you talked about your your kind of your local coastline spoke volumes there. I love it, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I suppose that's what I, I think. I have to say, from listening to you know, you know, earlier on there was a sort of an almost, you know, it, in the name of fairness, where we've had other people on who you know sort of work in or around politics. You know, we're we're, we're asking you these questions, you know, to to make sure that we we are injecting balance into our interviews. I feel like from chatting to you, I feel most comfortable when like we're finding ways of frothing about being at home and that, you know, I suppose it's now more expensive than ever. Like really, you know, and I, I, okay, maybe it's fine for me to say this because I, you know, like Rob, you know, I've been to Indonesia plenty of times and I got no regrets like, you know, and now I'm at a stage of my life, you know, little kids and whatever. But if you can find pleasure in surfing at home, you know, you, you, that is half the half of that surfer hypocrisy kind of neutralised then, isn't it? Yeah, and I sort of think that you know the, the you know finding the perfect weather is also about having the right quiver. You know, I surfed oh, at Druskin on on Sunday or was it Monday? It was like you know one and a half foot, but nice little waves on a on a foamy on an eight foot foamy all by myself. Yeah. Lovely, lovely little waves. I had a lot of fun. Um, um, I was bodyboarding with my son the other day. Great barrels, yeah. you know, good fun, you know, no one out. Yeah. Um, so you know, all sorts of craft. Um, and of course, you know, you want your favourite board on the on the right types of ways. But yeah. if you limit yourself to one craft, I think it's pretty, yeah. pretty challenging. But if you have a whole range, yeah. you you can sort of surf almost every day. A famous quote so, by, but, by Mickey Munoz and uh, you know one of our other uh, friends of the show, Elliot Dudley, who knows this one as well. It's, uh, How's it go? Um, there's no such thing as po- uh, no such thing as bad conditions. Just a poor choice of equipment and a lousy attitude. Yeah, exactly. You get equipment exactly. or attitude right, yeah. you're good to go. Totally, and, and you know you all, and also like you find the spots. You know the less travelled spots. You know there's spots near me in Truro. You know um, that you know they, they they don't pick up great waves, but because they're sort of novelty spots, they're so much so much fun. So you can have like a sloppy sort of junky two to three foot day, and it, it seems like seems like magic Kira suddenly <laughs> because it's sort of unusual, and and you just get a lot out of that, and it brings back what is really for me the true essence of surfing, which is just about the fun and the smiles and, and having a good time. And sometimes it can be so become so serious mm. and actually people forget, like it's about just that, that joy really that you want. And so, you know, that's sort of a renewable energy in itself, joy. So we should I, be spreading I a lot think, of that. Thank Hugo. That's the, magic, uh, magic. the prime opportunity to, to bring this to a close. So I'm going to say Hugo, thanks so much for Ain't taking no the, uh, the time to chat to us today on Crest in partnership with Elusive. And it's, it's been great to celebrate what an inspiration uh, for the British surfing community that this vision of yours and, and all the work that you do at SAS is. Thank you. Well, it's been great to talk to you. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to thank you as well. Yeah, you know, and, and plenty of food for thought. And uh, I, for one, am, uh, you know, I'm, while I'm looking forward, obviously listeners will be hearing this in the middle of autumn and hopefully surrounded by pumping surf, but we're recording this on the last couple of sort of high pressure days of the summer. Um, yeah. As you said, it's autumn tomorrow at the time of recording. So I, for one, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting the right equipment in the next bit of two foot onshore slop that we get. I'm feeling, you know, genuinely feeling really like refreshingly sort of pumped by that idea. But also, you know, to, you know, get get hunting around this autumn as the surf gets good. And so, you know, I'd love to I'd like to wish you, um, you know, a, a, a wave filled autumn as well, Hugo. Thank you. Um, you know, and that that kind of idea about making sure that you said that stoke stoke is a renewable energy in itself that's a, that's yeah. a really beautiful idea and uh, i'm going to be um saying that to lots of other people from now on and and always of course um you know giving you credit for it you know you'll get the royalties on that one uh, so thanks hugo well 
it's been great to talk to you and hopefully we'll get some waves together at some point in the not too distant That's future great. all right yeah thanks a lot guys so as you may have seen on our artwork and publicity this has been a crest in partnership with elusive first tuesday conversation the ability of these monthly chats to get to the heart of our surfing communities is not only due to the guests but the listeners who've commented and fed back to us on the episodes and discussions that we've had so a reminder of how to do this you can email us at castcrest at gmail.com or you can comment on either our instagram or twitter feeds our shows are all available on youtube as well as uh, the main podcast apps apple spotify and google and if you like what you hear, please do leave a review to that effect. And we've also got a big back catalogue of chats to go through, if you just scroll back. Before that, we wish you all some pumping autumn sessions. And once again, thanks for listening and see you soon. Diolcham grando, aguela chi en vian, Thanks.